Good morning, everyone, and a warm welcome to this rebroadcast of Scott Santucci's Growth Enablement Webinar. Sales enablement is at a crossroads. Where do we go from here? We had such a good response to Tuesday's session that we're repeating it today for those that missed it. And I know you will get a lot out of this uh, session. My name is Dave Irwin, and I've been involved in applying the principles of sales enablement my whole career, which means I have seen everything that doesn't work at least once but also many things that do work. And I'm introducing Scott this morning because I go all the way back to being the very first speaker on stage at Scott's inaugural sales enablement conference in 2011 when I was in my company a lot. I've known Scott for over a decade and I'm a huge fan of both his work and also his collaborative, highly engaged approach. And I wanted to get involved in this research initiative early on as I am like you, so curious about where things go from here given the massive business disruption we're all experiencing. It's also been 10 years since sales enablement was first covered by Scott when he was at Forrester Research. So it's fitting we have this important checkpoint for the community a decade later after Scott first defined the space. Now, when I met, first met Scott, he shared with me a really, really powerful blueprint he had designed for interconnecting all of the different tools, methods, and frameworks I had developed over the years to drive revenue growth into a cohesive whole. And I was able to evolve from Scott's blueprint, a system view that effectively orchestrated all those parts into the alignment of my company's capabilities to the desired outcomes of our target customers. And it absolutely paid off. It helped me in so many ways to simplify eliminate things I didn't need, align internal resources and budgets, fill in gaps, and coordinate all of these different functions into a coherent, repeatable process that we could organize around. I shared the business results I achieved at the time. Here is what they were over a multi-year period. A 22% increase in average year-over-year -year revenue growth, a 45% increase in average year-over-year -year profitability, a 32% increase in average year-over-year -year contract value sold, and a 52% increase in average year-over-year -year large key account growth, which was particularly significant. The point is I was able to drive results with a commercial system that fit my business. It absolutely works. So that's my message today. As it was then, it works. So it's no surprise given Scott's past leadership and approach that he has made this research initiative such a broad community effort which just makes all of this so valuable at a critical time. I'm really excited to introduce Scott to read out the findings and insights derived from this incredibly comprehensive study that reflects the input of so many on this call. So Scott, take it away. Thank you so much, Dave. And it's gonna be hard to live up to that. So hopefully I'm able to do that. Uh, in this, uh, this is a rebroadcast. This is a live rebroadcast. So what's interesting is on Tuesday, we had our first one and we had over 370 people register, which is overwhelming. And we had uh, 220 people uh, online. We've had another 50 people watch the, watch the rebroadcast. And what we've learned is there's a whole bunch of dialogue. So why we're, why we're redoing it live is because the chat is valuable too. So here's, here's sort of what we've set up for you. Uh, one, as many of you know, uh, Brian Lambert and I, and you can me introduce yourself, Brian, on the chat, uh, and I have a podcast called Inside Sales Enablement. And in Inside Sales Enablement, we work on uh, collaborator issues, and you'll, you'll, you'll understand what that means uh, later, uh, collaborator issues and, and evolution of sales enablement. And we're the ones who tackled this research initiative. So what we thought in, re in doing the rebroadcast, because the chat was so valuable and so engaging in the first one, we thought we'd do something different. We, did, we thought we would have a smaller attendance, so we did. We, you're, there are 32 of you on the line, so we want you to be engaged. For those of, those of you who are listening for the first time, maybe you don't pay attention to the chat. We also have a lot of people who are joining in, uh, and we have a special guest. So yesterday, if, if, you're, uh, if you're aware, we released, Brian and I on Inside Sales Enablement, dropped our episode with Hang Black. Hang Black is the head of sales enablement at Juniper, and she's been using a lot of the being heroic frameworks uh, that, that we've been talking about on our podcast to lead in a COVID period. This is her first time uh, exposed to our, our research findings. She was one of the 43 people whom we interviewed. 
So she's going to be put a, a little bit on the spot. So let's sort of imagine this is a virtual book signing tour for her, for her podcast. And if you want to engage with her, please feel free to do so. We also have a lot of people who are relisting. I'm going to ask you guys to feel free to ask other questions and engage everybody else. So if you are the type of person who has adult ADD like myself and just love to engage, pay attention to the chat. Brian will help, uh, help moderate it and facilitate it. He's also going to be available for links that you can follow on for following research. Now, on this, uh, on this side, on my track, I'm not going to be paying attention to the chat at all. I'm going to be going through the content and the research. So hopefully that's a good frame for all of us. So launching into that, here are our findings from an overall research project that, that we've done. And I'm excited to share them with you. One of the things that we've learned about audiences is that some of us want to know the answer right away. So let's pay that out right now. Here's what we're going to tell you. So this is a contract that we're, we're going to make together between you and me. Here's what I am going to tell you. I'm going to tell you three things. One, sales enabling has emerged as the antidote to an invisible problem we call productitis. This discipline will cure this disease by evolving from fixing salespeople to orchestrating the commercial system. So that's one thing we're going to talk about. Two, companies need to develop stratocution capabilities that are provided by orchestrators. The internal business they run are all different forms of sales enablement. And three, to treat productitis, leaders will need to act rapidly, but also thoughtfully. Start by creating a baseline of your current state environment, then quickly drive a series of targeted and coordinated sprints. So there we go. Uh, if, if you want just the findings, you can, you can, you can leave now, but we're going to go forward and go through. Now we're going to tell it more in, in terms of a story. So our first section is, I love this quote, it ain't what you don't know that gets you in trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. So let's talk about what that means because there's a, as we all know, there's a lot of perceptions of what sales and A1 is and we're moving forward in a, in a different direction. So synthesizing executable uh, insights. This is basically the research method that we did that we're paying out. So the, the question was how to execute in the new normal and specifically what is sales enablement's role in executing in the new normal. So what did we do is we actually did an open-ended survey. For those of you who've taken the survey, please share with the uh, attendees how hard that survey was because it was open-ended and it was a lot of thoughtful questions. And we got uh, 102 responses. When you take in 102 open-ended responses, it's pretty hard to sort out. So we solicited uh, sort of friends of the show, uh, experts that I've known who've been involved in the sales and enablement space for at least 10 years. And I wanted to get 20 of, of my peers to be able to look at it. We had 43, including the CEOs of the top, uh, of all of the top four sales enablement vendors. So that was fantastic to be able to get that research. And what those ex experts did was really react to the survey results that I, that I compiled for everybody. Then uh, we, we executed or wrapped up panel discussions. We had six panel discussions. And if you look at the little octopus uh, diagram, the goal was to take out different flavors or different perspectives of folks who look at sales enablement, sales enablement practitioners, sales enablement experts, sales leaders, um, uh, executive sponsors of sales enablement programs, professors, sales enablement people with an L&D background. Now we hope to add to this uh, with vendors and also marketers and human resource professionals, CFOs. We're going to keep adding more and more perspectives because as we all know, revenue, revenue is a team sport and it includes everybody. So that's our research process. So let's pay out some of the findings. So one question in, in our survey is sales enablement on the rise or is it in decline? And it's probably no surprise that sales enablement professionals, the overwhelming majority of sales enablement professionals think it's on the rise. Here's some of the feedback of some of the quotes. Uh, obviously you're gonna be able to look, look, at these, uh, look at these later when you get some of, the, some of the slides we provide. But I wanted to highlight some of the trends. Those who think it's on the rise, highlight more of the business problems that it's addressing rather than what its current state is today. Those who think it's on decline are all in agreement that there are business problems, yet 
the high level business problems to address, yet they're concerned about the results being generated. So really it's, it's, um, it's not really an issue of rise or decline. It's more of an issue of, are we generating results or not? So to give an example, two ex extremes of the example, if you look at the bottom quote at the, down there at the bottom, when the blank hits the fan, enablement training are, uh, are usually the first to be let go. And right now, COVID-19, we're in the manure pile. I think that's a call to action of, are we really, really clear that we're being valuable? On the second, uh, the opposite side of that is I think we're seeing failures in the results of, and the sustainability of those results. That's uh, a failure point of the, uh, to deliver. However, if you look at sort of the optimistic responses, it's actually a con consolidation of several functions to support the lead to close win ROS process and customer engagement activity. It's on the rise due to consolidation of existing roles and responsibilities. That's highlighting of a orchestration or a blending of things together. And that's really indicative of a lot of state of where we are in terms of this profession. Now let's go on is uh, uh, one of the questions that we asked is we used a metaphor uh, looking at sales enablement as a business within a business. So what business is sales enablement in the first place? And the overwhelming majority of the respondents said sales enablement is like a consulting service. And to pull out some of the flavor of how difficult this question was to ask is look at, uh, look at some of these responses. What business are you in? Well, we're a general contractor, therapist, EMS. I'm, I'm not really sure <laughs> that's indicative of a lot. But then if you look at some of the other ones that uh, used a real life business as a metaphor, you look at FedEx, uh, we're pulling the people process and technology to deliver what's needed at the right place at the right time during the sales process or we're an oil and exploration, oil and oil exploration production company. We figure out where there might be opportunity. Run some tests to figure out if it's worth your time. If so, invest the time and energy and then pump it till it's dry and move on. I, lo I love that. Uh, maybe we come back and do some fracking if the wells run dry. Really great color in all of these different areas. And you can see there's a lot of different perspectives about what business sales enablement is. So who's the customer? So this is a question in our panel uh, when we were talking about what your favorite question was in our panel with sales leaders, Skip Miller actually said, I thought on the, on the first blush when I took the survey, what a stupid question about who's the customer until I saw all the responses because everybody thinks the customer of sales enablement is obvious. But if it's obvious to one of us, it might not be obvious to everybody in the community with whom we're trying to uh, impact. So if you, look at, uh, if you look at the feedback around the horn, it was mattered all over the place. You have, on the one hand, it's sales, marketing, operations, and technology industry are the customers of sales enablement. If done right, the end user, the end customer is, everyone involved in sales cycles. I think, it's, uh, it, I think there, if there's one customer, it's a blend between the executive sales rep and prospect. I think that's pretty funny. Like, there, how's that one customer? But if you look at uh, uh, you know, the word cloud here, the overwhelming majority of people believe that the customer of sales enablement is sales. So that's another indication. And do you agree with that or not? And these are things that are really important because if we don't know who our customers are, how can we service them? So then finally, the last one and probably the most, uh, the most telling is what's the value of sales enablement anyway? And the way that we asked this question was, if you were imagining a letter to shareholders, what would it be? And this was the one that I think uh, uh, brought out the most clarity because there was the most lack of clarity and the most variation responses. So let me go through why we laid it out this way. I would say the bulk of the responses were like the, tough, the top one. This is a tough question to answer without further context or a lot of people would give me coaching on how I should design surveys in the first place, uh, or sorry, this question is too broad. Uh, other people said, you know, I feel like this is a loaded question that plays into insert uh, vendor website here, go read their websites. Or it looks like you're fishing for something about my ramp and velocity and what my KPIs are. Then there was another flavor, which would be to judge uh, your peers. So if you look at the, I think a best example of that would be in the second quote 
a lot of waffle. Enablement practitioners as a whole are disastrously bad at demonstrating their impact and staying focused on one thing. So I'd say about 60% of the responses were either, I don't like this question, this question is really hard, or a commentary about how other people would answer it. But then if you look in the highlighted area, there were a handful of people who actually answered the question as if they were the CEO of a company and how they communicate it. And listen to this one, keep in mind, this is somebody at a survey just typing away in the moment and then hitting the send button it's very unlikely that they spent a lot of time thinking about their response. This was emotive. This is how they work, how they are, how they be. Last year, we formalized the Sales Enablement Program. We took Sales Enablement from ad hoc to a program that is measurable, repeatable, and dynamic. We aligned the messaging and the channel and, and internal sales. We decreased new hire onboarding time. We kept average tenure consistent with individual contributors and managers and increased tenure in our most experienced roles, showing positive retention and a clear program path. Next year, we will focus on manager enablement and, and formalize bottoms-up feedback for all sales enablement services to keep the program relevant, agile, and dynamic. If this doesn't say we're all over the place in terms of what we think our value is as a community, I don't know what else does. So for me, this really begged the question, what is sales enablement? What is a platypus? What the heck is this thing? What is sales enablement? Is sales enablement a market? On the one hand, Showpad, Seismic, Highspot, and MindTickle have raised over $600 million in funding and have 50 companies amongst them that spend over a $1 million per year. So that's, pretty, that's some evidence that we have a market. However, on the other side, you have ClearSlide, Savo, Docurated, Ventaso, I'm sure there's a whole bunch of others, uh, have, they raised over $200 million in funding and all were bought for pennies on the dollar or some are no longer even in existence. So what gives? Is there something here or is there something not? I'd also add that at this moment in time, there has been no big exit. So an exit might be if you think about some of the, like Marketo had a big exit. Uh, so that validates the marketing operation space. What space or what market is sales enabling? Okay, well, let's move on to the profession. Does it meet a profession? So I asked Brian to help me figure out and come up with a litmus test. He found uh, some litmus test uh, criteria used. So this, is, th this would be, a, how do I determine whether or not a doctor is a quack, <laughs> to be simple about it? Why should I take somebody as being a professional? And these are the criteria. So does sales enablement have an easily accessible and validated body of knowledge? Nope. Is there an industry recognized standard of entry? Nope, anybody can say they're a sales enablement practitioner. Is there a sanctioning organization that validates either best practices or a body of knowledge? Nope. Is there a code of ethics that's enforced? Nope. Is there a service to the profession? Well, I think uh, one thing that sets sales enablement people apart from anybody is their desire to help one another. And that's definitely something I think all of us are very proud of. And it bleeds over into the other side of the column. So we meet none of the criteria or not enough of the criteria to be a profession yet. Over 10,000 people have job titles with enablement in it. The Sales Enablement Society is a 100% volunteer organization that has over 7,000 members uh, there's a dedicated community board, there's a conference, there's podcasts for members. Uh, they have a conference, an annual conference. All of these different things were created 100% by volunteers. So what gives? So the rest of this part is the analysis part. So let's figure out what's really happening. Let's break down why we have so many different sale flavors of sales enablement, versions of sales enablement, variations of sales enablement, all of those uh, activities, all under one umbrella. Let's figure out what's happening. So let's start with where does sales activities come from in the first place? And we all know this, your CEO is working with investors. They wanna see a more productive, productive sales force. So the CEO says to the direct reports of the business, I wanna see a more productive sales force. And then what do you get? The product team says, we'll get on that. And the human resources says, we'll get on that. And marketing says, 
we'll get on that. And sales says, we'll get on that. So what do we get as a result? We get an inventory of activities to quote unquote help. So all of these different mason jars represent activities that are cr coming from all of those different departments. Training, packaging, competency models, compensation, job description, performance, QBR pr processes, ROI calculators, on and on and on. And in each of these jars, all these jars are being just thrown out uh, and made available to sales organizations. So one of the things to figure out then is I'm a big fan of accounting for things. So what does all of this stuff cost? So if these are tools to help sales, let's figure out what it costs first because maybe there's, a, maybe there's something really revealing in all that. So what I'd like you to do is imagine this as a, as a money changer and the top, the green at the part is all those jars being poured in. And in order for us to figure out what money is spent where, there's really two buckets of, of thinking about as a sales system. One is the structure of it, AKA the, the job titles, the head count of the salespeople, and then the compensation plans and how you manage them. Think about the structure of the sales force. And then on the other hand, think about all the investments to support the sales force. And with this kind of clarity, this helps us put into, put, make apples to apples comparisons of what we're working on. And then over here where it says zero total spend, that'll be the summation. And what I'm gonna walk through, I wanna make sure this is very clear. This isn't industry averages. This is the reality of one individual company. So, so uh, pay attention and, and, and follow along here because it's, it's very precise in, in the steps, but this is what you know, your accounting department and, and finance does. So if we break these parts down into, into their buckets, under the structure of sales, the base costs are not part of this analysis. So base costs mean the salary, the benefits load, infrastructure, acquisition. So all these costs your company might wanna look at, but they're not part of this analysis. So you see none of the dollars are, are highlighted here. But then when you look at the variable costs, one of the things that's interesting about every time you hire a salesperson, they actually consume a variety of different resources. You have to pay them uh, commissions, their incentive programs, there's a cost of reporting. In this particular analysis, the company wanted to look at T&E as inclusive of the sales enabling initiative because they thought if they had a standardized demo program, for example, they would be able to dramatically or make a big dent in their t and &E costs. So we add it up and per rep per year, $186,000 is spent for uh, t and &E that's related to driving sales. Okay, now let's move on. Now when we move to the support costs, how do we account for the overhead? And in this case, if we think about it like a business within a business, what's the overhead in the sales organization? Well, it's sales managers, and it's sales leadership, it's sales operation heads, and it's your salary as a sales enablement person. Um, so all of those things together are the, oper uh, are the overhead of running that. So if you add up all of that spend, that's, that's another $87,000 per rep or $273,000 total. Then there's other investments made in this, uh, uh, to develop the sales organization. You have performance improvement programs, training and education, methods and, and job aids, all of, these, uh, all of these individual activities, these mason jars, if you put them into categories, they add up. So now just in terms of the development, we're at $356,000 per rep. Now we're not focusing on any of the costs to scale or make the sales force uh, create more leverage for the sales force. So now we have to account for the overhead of the, head, of the people who are in departments like L&D or marketing or product groups who are also spending or creating those mason chars. So that's $21,000 extra that we add to it. But then you throw in all the other activities, the collateral and tools generated, the sales support services that they provide, the demand generation activities that they provide, and we get a number of $502,000, all said and done. So when we look at this as a whole, how much do our, our, is this company spending per rep? $502,000. And the question and the readout to the executive team is, what would your top rep spend if they had $502,000 budget to spend? Would they spend it on all the mason jars or what would they spend it on? And we, we found that's a big clarifying question. 
Now, this is a really great tool or way to help identify what the costs are and to coordinate the, way, the waste and have these kinds of discussions. But what is the view from your investors? So we talked about the, initi the initiation of all these activities being the CEO talking to investors and saying, hey, we want more productivity. What does the lens of productivity look like from investors? So what, do we, what investors see is something far simple. It's far simpler than a lot of us give any, any credit to, myself included. And really what they look at is it's your income statement. And they look at the top line, which is just the revenue line. They look at expenses and the operating margin. At a very, very high level, they think sales and marketing should be delivering revenue growth for us. Not just, not revenue, because there's an ongoing element of revenue. Uh, they want to see revenue growth. Um, when they look at the expense item, they, they, they see sales and marketing spend a lot. $502,000 per rep, if you saw that last company. That's a lot of expense. And when you look at the income statement, sales and marketing expenses tend to be the largest expense item in the company. So if you want to have operating margin or EBITDA or whatever term you want to call it, you want to be able to get more for, more for your spending. And since sales and marketing is a big expense item, it's going to attract attention. Well, don't take my word for it. Uh, we were lucky enough to uh, have worked with uh, TCV, one of the largest private equity companies, so a good representation of investors. These are the people who brought to us, so thank God they exist because we wouldn't have Netflix or be able to watch uh, um, The Lion King, is that it? The Tiger King, Tiger King, we wouldn't be able to watch that. Um, or maybe bad for them, but we wouldn't have Airbnb or other firms like that. So they're one of the leading private equity firms uh, in existence. And they're one of, the, one of the people who say, we'd like to get a better return from the money that we give you uh, as investor for the sales and marketing expense. So please pay attention to this quote. Uh, we, we don't have permission to share it in our, in our thing. So maybe you wanna write it or screen grab it for yourself. Uh, but we see great opportunity for businesses to improve their performance by becoming more efficient with their sales and marketing spending. The lens being, there is no difference uh, to an investor of sales and marketing. They're two sides of the same coin. They are investments to, to drive revenue growth. The second thing is to help our portfolio companies improve their productivity, we're introducing a new metric we call the commercial ratio. So that's the introduction of what I'm gonna share in the next slide. I think here's another key point to pay attention to through the rest of the presentation. This ratio helps us align strategy and tactics while at the same time get functional leaders to improve how they communicate with each other. So what is the commercial ratio? The commercial ratio is really simply this. It's the revenue growth that you have. So the revenue that you had last year, this year subtracted from the revenue last year and all of the sales and marketing expense. The belief here is that 100% of sales and marketing expense should go to revenue growth. And of course, there's always exceptions, but that's the go-in position to look at it from a top down perspective and see whether or not, what this ratio tells us is, is there health in that business and should we inspect sales enablement or sales and marketing costs more? So what, is that, what does that ratio need to look like? Well, if you look at it, it's more like an engine. So you can rev your engine too high or you can uh, not have your engine work well enough. If you think about sales and marketing as a value communications engine, uh, there's a way to, to balance that and there's expectations associated with it. If your ratio is 1.5 or higher, the belief is you're probably not investing enough in sales and marketing and capitalizing on opportunity. You probably have an opportunity to gain more market share. If on the other hand, if it's below 0.75, you are highly inefficient and it needs to be addressed. Uh, the green zone between 0.75 and 0.125 is where they wanna look at it. Unfortunately, if you were to do the calculation yourself, your company would probably be in the 0.2 or uh, 0.3 range. And those would be areas of you're going to invite scrutiny from investors. So this is an opportunity uh, to, to get right. Okay, so what's the underlying cause? Where does this inefficiency come from? Well, simply, it's a lack of coordination. 
if you look on the left, there's a lot of very, there's a lot of changing environments that are happening inside your company today. There's also a lot of changing environments that's happening inside your customers. The question is, we're putting our salespeople or all of our client facing people in between to try to master both of those. And we're putting our salespeople in a really bad spot and overburdening them. And if you look at all these different categories, how many of these things are orchestrated? How much do you know about what really is happening in the customer environment? And no, I don't think using data that says 11.8 stakeholders are involved is even close, remotely close to a qualifier of understanding your customer environment. Uh, so let's just call that out right now. The point is, there are so many different things happening in your company. There's so many different details that we're trying to put onto the sales force. There, it creates a huge amount of burden. And one of the big questions to ask is if, if, if we recognize that the salesperson is stuck in the middle, who is responsible for their success? So what does all of this create? It creates this. This. How does this make you feel? How does it make you react? Because this is the burden that we're placing on the backs of your salespeople. This is the burden that we're placing on the backs of customers. This is the thing, this puzzle or mess or however you want to characterize it. What would name would you give it? But this is what we're putting on the backs of customers and salespeople. And this is the, the result of the lack of coordination that we talked about. So what is this? We call it productitis. And to put some structure around this, the productitis, the culprit of this mess, really is a big sea change. And it's a sea change that's been happening, but COVID has really illuminated it. Productitis is really the, the, the whole idea of seeing the world 100% through your lens, through your perspective, through your product. So the focus of what, what's valuable is the products valuable. We need to be able to move to the outcome or the business result for our clients is what's valuable. How do we describe the attributes of value? Well, in a product centric world, we talk about the features of the things the product does. What we need to be talking about are the capabilities our clients require to achieve their outcomes. Uh, the barometer, how do we judge whether we're communicating value or not? In a product centric company, we compare against our competitors. Well, our competitors say this and we're better than our competitors. What we really need to do is who is the wallet owner that's going to fund uh, the outcome and what do they think? The, how do we judge the impact of the value we're communicating? Well, in a product-centric world, it's the benefits. And we, we try to make each benefit and justify it by either what it costs us to do or what it would cost the other company to do. Why aren't we communicating the, bene, the measurable results of achieved business outcomes? Uh, if we want to make our message and the materials that we're communicating relatable to customers, what do we do in a product-centric world? We do use cases. What do you do in a customer-centric world? You highlight common business scenarios and say, here's what was before looked like, here's what after looked like. And then if we wanna create proof, proof of the value that we can provide, in a product-centric world, we do demos. Demos, demos, demos. Let's get to the demo as quickly as possible. If we wanna be a customer-centered world, what we wanna do is benefit realization. So the, how are companies coping with productitis? Well, at the top, it, if we're in a show up and throw up mode where salespeople are taking that information and just giving it to, to giving it customers or different groups are communicating it directly, guess what's happening? We are asking our customers to digest it. So that's the first scenario. Is that going to be valuable? No, it's not. Many of us uh, are investing in resources to improve or fix our salespeople. So we're asking our salespeople to lasso or corral that capability. Uh, we've known for years, for at least four years, only about 20% of sellers have the ability to do it. The good news is the 20% of salespeople who can do it create value for customers and they give them the map of success and the light bulb effect. Unfortunately, 80% of the sales organization struggle to do it. So the question is, how come companies aren't managing this chaos programmatically, systemically, over as a company, and preventing the chaos from uh, getting to the salespeople and to the customers. This is the opportunity, 
And it's really what, what, what comes down to if we're moving into a world where customer experience and value is more important than the products themselves, it's something that needs to be tackled. So the question, the question that executive teams need to make and why sales enablement is really emerged is a choice. Do we treat productitis, AKA fix the system, or do we continue to try to focus on, on micro ways to fix salespeople? Like give them time management training, that's what they need, or they need more tools or more ROI kits, et cetera. This is the choice to be made. And our argument is that sales enablement needs to move to fixing the system and move away from fixing the people. Okay, so that's our, that's our case of thinking differently. Now let's talk about the definition of insanity is doing the same things over and over again, expecting a different result. How do we create a different kind of muscle memory? So some of you, some of you right now are probably feeling, wow, that's a great diagnostic of the problem, but it makes me very nervous because how am I going to bring that up inside my organization? And what we, you'd have to do is you're going to have to be able to prepare some different decision-making tools because right now the trigger effect, the motion that people are in is, if I wanna fix a sales problem, we need to pre prescribe an activity. So let's talk about that. Let's dwell on this ball again here, this uh, big mess of productitis. I asked you earlier how it makes you feel. It doesn't make anybody feel good. And the reason it doesn't make anybody feel good is we as human beings are designed to avoid complexity. We're designed to um, just really dislike ambiguity uh, and, in, in a business sense, businesses don't like uh, uh, risk, and that's what ambiguity, ambiguity is. And they sure don't like uh, complexity because complexity means a lack of control. So in the, in the zone of we wanna have more control and we wanna have more order, the approach that most, of, most businesses are taking to get more control is actually making it less controllable. So unfortunately, we have to act, actually talk about the elephant in the room which is we have a complex problem that currently is ambiguous. No one can say they know how COVID is gonna emerge, which means we have to have different decision-making models than we're accustomed to. So what are those different, dis di different decision-making models that we have to learn to develop, those new skills? So if you think about this as a trend, businesses used to uh, be instinct-driven. And what they would do is they would hire experts, people who are really well accomplished in their field and give them executive roles. And that works to a point, but when that instinct, when problems occur, what happens is you get a lot of firefighting because each one are so opinion driven. So it creates too much internal conflict, there's uh, issue avoidance and workarounds. So we've emerged every business around, it's almost like a tagline, you gotta be data driven this, data driven that. Uh, and, and data is good uh, if you have a way to make decisions against, against it. If you have too much data, it's overwhelming. And I'd argue right now we're in a state of over-analysis. So many of us are drowning in operational stats. I know one company that collects over 5,000 metrics to evaluate the sales force. I kid you not. Uh, it creates to slow move to cover without data. But I think another uh, key important part the market that you're in right now is emerging as we speak. New things are occurring. And if you wait for all the data to happen, you could be left out. So what happens is companies get paralyzed. So you don't want to be in a firefighting mode and just doing stuff. That's bad. But you don't want to be paralyzed. So this is where insight driven is really beneficial. We have the benefit of human wisdom to be able to take advantage of all these things. And it creates agility. So what is an insight-driven approach? You take the data that you do have, you go and go collect the reality, similar to how we interviewed a whole bunch of people, and then you apply expertise to it and you get executable insights. I think this is really important that you have this in your repertoire because if you bring up some of these issues without recognizing that your executives might be in a data-driven or an instinct-driven uh, approach, it's important that you have the right messaging and framing it out. So what is an important capability that you need to develop? So one of the things that we run into a lot in the sales enablement world is either your strategic or your tactical. And the reality is, is what we got from speaking with the executive sponsors is their need right now is someone who can do both. 
a balance between are we doing the right things and are we doing things right? People who can pick the exact thing to do right now in the moment, but that right thing in the now in the moment is towards an overall plan. And developing the tools to do this, we call stratocution. And this is something that's uh, emerged consistently across the leader, the sales enablement leaders that have the most impact and the most weight and the most, uh, the best business results. But it's a label that has avoided uh, the uh, uh, many people in the executive team because they think, you know, we're going to do strategic planning here and then it's execution time, it's activity time. But there, hopefully I've made a very clear case that we need something in the middle and plan thoughtful, uh, thoughtful activities. So what does Stratocution require? So in order to have the business capability of Stratocution, you need an orchestrator to do it. That there, there needs to be a different type of person who can be, who can execute on the Stratocution capability. So there are six characteristics that we've identified from executive leaders. One, an orchestrator is mission and goal focused, not result driven. This is a very key point. Two, they prioritize the right goals at the right moments. So there isn't a rigid project plan. It's more fluid than that, but it's very vision, uh, vision driven. You guide the narrative by confronting reality. You drive results by design, not effort. You unlock energy and create momentum uh, it, among people because people are, are very, very important. And you catalyze change through collaboration, not by force. So what... So orchestrators are leaders who run a business within a business. The way they conceive of their departments aren't the ad hoc, you know, we can get anything done. They're people who imagine blending people, process, technology, and information together. So a business, if you think about it simply, a business converts resources into value by harnessing the people, process, technologies, and information available across the company to create the cohesiveness required to achieve the measurable outcome of their mission. Okay, I know that sounds a little consultant and textbooky, but we needed to get some definition down by where these specific gaps are happening, why we have this big, big, big mess that's preventing salespeople and customers from really seeing the true value of what you're offering. So the question that you have to ask yourself right now, Right now, if you wanna be in the business of being in the Stratocution business and helping solve some of these problems, the big question a lot of us need to ask in sales enabling is, am I a doer or am I an orchestrator? How do I see the value that I bring to my, bring to my company? Do I see myself as bringing value because I get stuff done? Or do I see value in that I design environments where other people can thrive? You have to decide one or the other. You can't be both. Okay, so what we're seeing then is how does this map out to the evolution of sales enablement? So we see a sales enablement as this big umbrella, and it's an umbrella term. Right now, the term is meaningless, so I think any effort to define it is a complete waste of time. I think what we do is we just move forward and say sales enablement is a market label, and, and there are different types of enablement under that market label. So going from left to right, if you are a doer, you're probably aligned to an individual project. Like I'm bringing out customer journeys. That's what I do. That's what I'm enabling. Or I'm the sales kickoff person, or we're doing sales training or you know, playbooks or onboarding. If you're that type of person, you are doing response enablement. Now moving into the middle, the orchestrators where they start to to shine is they're driving orchestration among different departments and different groups to produce business results. There's talent enablement, for example, where they're bridging the divide between finance, sales, and human resources. They're filtering, they're applying a procedure to filter out all of the random acts and activities into some cohesive programs with the goal, business goals of reduce attrition, create better skills, faster time for performance. So that's that model. And you can see that model repeat. It's just the focus changes. So you have message enablement that's focusing on targeted buyer insights, concrete differentiation, or consumable content, bringing marketing, sales, and IT together. Or you have organization enablement, which uh, is about quicker decisions or reduced confusion, faster quotes, freeing up more time for salespeople, however you want to define it. 
And that's basically getting all the different administrative groups that are, oh my gosh, all over the place uh, to be able to get right. Or there's pipeline enablement where we concentrate on streamlining all of the stuff we're bombarding salespeople for to do three things, improve win rates, shorten sales cycle times or larger deals. And then you do have a handful of, uh, of people in our community who are doing what we call commercial enablement. The reason we call it commercial enablement because it ties to the commercial ratio. Who is working to systematically improve that overall ratio so that we move the needle from being a sales and marketing being a very wasteful expense to something that actually is producing a return of investment. So that's a, a, a sort of a map or a landscape view to look at it. Here's a simpler way or probably my, my personal favorite way to look at it. Uh, going back to pay off of what business uh, within a business you're in, the doer, are, if you're in response enablement, what you need to be doing is consolidating so that there aren't a whole bunch of individual quote unquote sales enablers all doing ABM or demand gen and individually and saying they're doing sales enablement. You want to consolidate it. And if you want to be in that response mode, your business with a business is geek squad. You are uh, a, a great help desk to be able to solve problems quickly. And that's, that's the, what, what business you can provide. And that's, that's valuable. Then orchestrators, if you're in talent enablement, you should probably be thinking, Hey, we're Harvard for sales. Uh, Harvard w definitely worries about the, uh, the talent, the, the crop that's coming in. They only want the best candidates. You only want to best, be, do the, be, be involved in the best salespeople. How come we're not more involved in the recruitment? All the way through, through evaluation and onboarding and coaching and all of those activities. We need to think holistically that way. If you're, if you're focused on message enablement, Think of our, ourselves as Ogilvy, Ogilvy for sales. And I even like Mad Men for sales because it's sort of the birth of the, of the branding industry. We're going to have a rebirth of what branding in the trenches looks like. So how do we get the message right when we have so many different stakeholders whom all see value, uh, the value of our products and services differently? If we want to be organizational enablement, we want to be like systems, uh, systems integrators. There's so many broken things involved inside our companies, even including our, our, our SKUs, the inventory SKUs and how unrationalized it all is. The opportunity to fix a lot of broken things, a lot of productitis exists, but we have to develop the skills of like at work center or a systems integrator for sales. And then, um, the next one is pipeline enablement, Tiffany's for sales. If you've ever learned anything about Tiffany, selling diamonds is really hard because it's all about the perception of value. So they concentrate 100% on the buying experience. The pipeline is about that Tiffany's type buying experience end to end and making it come to life. And then if you want to really move or change your trajectory uh, from being 0 0.10 uh, in terms of your commercial ratio to 1.25, that's transformative. You don't transform by just rearranging the deck, uh, re re rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. You got to fundamentally transform. In that case, think about yourself as NASA for sales, taking on new, inventing new math, thinking about new ways of doing it in a coordinated way, where you're taking the skills from Harvard, the skills from Ogilvy, the the capabilities from Accenture, and the uh, the focus of uh, experience from Tiffany's, and blending them together into one big mission. So this is the evolution of sales enablement. And the way to think about that is between the green and the, and the purple, if, if we were to say sales enablement as a whole is a product uh, or, or an industry, we're clearly an industry that's stuck in the chasm, if you remember the Jeffrey Moore work. So in order to merge out of the chasm, we have to stop doing random things or ad hoc things or looking for silver bullets. I think an, uh, another uh, disadvantage of our sales enablement community has been we've been uh, focused on silver bullets, uh, the silver bullet of challenger or the silver bullet of something else or the silver bullet of messaging or one tactic or one new uh, approach that is going to solve all these problems. The reality is silver bullets only work on werewolves and werewolves don't exist in real life. What exists in real life isn't a nice, neat, neat, neat little narrative who would know the villain is. It's complex and we need to start uh, applying some thoughtfulness to it. So the point that you have to say is, um, you know, uh, many people will say, well, I need to do both or let me think about it. But if you, if you 
choose not to decide, you still have made a choice. So you need to make a choice. Are you a doer? And then focus on how I can be more, uh, build my skills to be more geek squad for sales and communicate that value. Or I'm an orchestrator and then if I am, how do I build my value proposition for myself, my department, and how will I learn to communicate it with, to, to executive management? How will I learn to use uh, those, those skills forward? Okay, so the third part and the last conclusion, you know, we're, we're closing it up here. Our, our next quote is by Winston Churchill. Never let a good crisis go to waste. So what does all of this do? What, why does all of this matter? What's, what's the key here is fundamentally right now in your company, you need to identify the waste. You are going to likely go through another round of cost cuts. This COVID thing is lasting longer than people have anticipated. So you basically the, the way that I like to think about it is you have to learn to cut fat, not bone. While at the same time, we have to develop entirely new muscles. This is a task or a challenge no one has ever been able to address for it requires leadership. So what you wanna do is be proactive and help your company identify the waste. Then what you wanna do is you wanna say, here's the waste that needs to be put into the cost savings bucket, but we need to reinvest some of this waste into things that we can drive change. And we're gonna to have to move into a zone of driving change quickly. So this is an example of the need for stratocution. You have to be incredibly thoughtful, but you have to move incredibly quick. So what does that look like? How do you do that? Well, what you do is you start by understanding what is happening. I call this building a baseline. And what, there are things that many companies don't do when they analyze their situation. They don't focus on what's working. And that's an incredibly huge mistake. There's a lot of focus on what doesn't work, and if you keep focusing on what doesn't work, you're gonna make incremental improvements. The opportunity is to find what's working, figure out what your top reps are doing, figure out what, why your cut top customers are, are, are buying from you and be open-minded and listening, not prescribing. The second thing then is once you have, uh, once you have the what's working, you're gonna to wanna to figure out what are the barriers that prevent the whole company from delivering the value that those top customers are looking for in a way that those top reps are doing it. What stands in our way? That's a question that needs to be asked. It's easily identifiable. You just have to go and do it. And then the second, then the third part then is, so what resources are invested that are being contributing to obstacles and what, in, what resources could be in re reinvested? When you lay this case out very cleanly, pure clarity emerges amongst a lot of chaos. The uncomfortable part is doing a baseline analysis when we don't, uh, or uh, asking the questions of what's working. So what happens next? What happens next is clear strategies of execution move forward. Think about the business within a business. A business has to execute, has to have a business strategy. What is the business strategy for how we're going to execute or rebuild our pipelines moving forward? Well, we need, will we need to innovate? Are we finding that the overall buying experience that we have with our customers is horrible? So we need to prioritize Tiffany, uh, the Tiffany for sales. Are we finding that our messaging is atrocious or super product laden? You know, it's got uh, massive amounts of productitis. Well, then we need to concentrate on Ogilvy for sales. If we find out that really we're just a big, massive bloat of bureaucracy, which a lot of companies are these days, well, then we need to concentrate on operational excellence and we need to focus on the Accenture for sales or talent enablement. These are very simple things to deal with once you organize all of the different variables. And then underneath, of the, underneath those categories, what you need to do is identify fast action tactics. Here's a few of the fast action tactics that we've found that have a great yield or return on investment when you clear it, like hyper-targeting customer stakeholders under pipeline enablement. No, I didn't say uh, personas. That's a completely different topic. Um, but it's hyper, hyper, hyper-targeting on where the value is. There's many, many, many things you can do that are all coordinated. And the key about these tight acceleration plans is your company probably doesn't have the muscle memory to collaborate across functions to solve uh, new complex problems. So you wanna pick very, very specific ones so that as you're executing, you're building the muscle to learn how to change uh, moving forward. 
Uh, one of the quick plugs of how you can engage growth enablement is we have very quick, rapid assessments to help you figure out those baselines and sell it inside your company. And then also we have an inventory of these different action plans that have worked in other companies that could be deployed after you do that analysis. So let's a review what was just covered. So one, if you remember our, our Mark Twain quote, it ain't what you don't know that gets you in trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. Sales enablement has emerged as the antidote to the invisible pro problem, productitis. The discipline will cure the disease by evolving from fixing salespeople to orchestrating the commercial system. Two, uh, the definition of insanity is doing the same things over and over again and expecting different results. What we wanted to share with you are some frameworks to have different decisions, to make different decisions. So the first framework is let's talk about insights versus data driven. And the second insight is we need to be orchestrators versus, uh, versus doers. And then the third insight is um, stratocution and putting all of these things together gives us a clear business within a business to move forward from. And then the third bucket that we want to do is never let a good crisis go to waste. There's never been a better opportunity for leadership to emerge and a role to establish itself as a very powerful function within a company. Treat product, to treat product titers, leaders will need to act rapidly but thoughtfully. So the balancing between the two. Start by creating a baseline of your current state environment, then quickly drive to a series of targeted, coordinated sprints. So what are your next actions? Engage, contact me directly uh, for uh, uh, what, what we could do or how we might approach a quick wellness plan for your company. Uh, the next thing is register. We're gonna have a manufacturer healthy pipeline by mastering the middle. We had to strip out a lot of the lessons learned about pipelines and how horrible they are and what people are doing to fix them. So we've moved that to another uh, webinar. Uh, join us on June 4th at 1 p.m. Eastern. Uh, or continuously learn. If you're not listening to the podcast Brian and I do it inside at salesenablement.com, you should listen to it. It's 100% orchestrator focused and it's conversations about what's going on and how to navigate all of this complex environment. Uh, so with that, I'm going to wrap up and ask, uh, ask Dave if there's, uh, Dave or Brian, if there's any questions that we could ask in, in the middle. Here's, uh, here's the contact information for me. Thank you so much for participating. I hope you all found this uh, very, very, very valuable. Uh, Dave, are there any questions that, Dave or Brian, are there any questions that we should ask and answer in the short time we've got left? Uh, not right now, Scott. Just a lot of confirmation and uh, calling out things like leadership, stakeholder management, uh, alignment support, having the right measures. Just a lot of confirmation that... Uh, folks are thinking this way and, and in this in this uh, in this vein so I don't see any questions just a lot of good feedback in the chat awesome so Dave what would be the the summary uh, here of what you learned from uh, uh, from the chat because I didn't get to see any of that and uh, please close us out great yeah I think there's a lot of aligned thinking to what you presented Scott you know for all of us that have been at this for a, a long time it's clearly a, a moment to uh, take advantage of in terms of resetting and repositioning what sales enablement can be and what it can accomplish. Some of the key comments were how to much better align the inputs to the outputs um, to create a more direct correlation to uh, results and value. I think there is a lot of agreement that a systems approach versus uh, fixing uh, salespeople um, couldn't be a better, couldn't come at a better time in terms of um, resetting, you know, what, uh, what everybody has a chance to do right now, given the, uh, the uh, business disruption that we've had. So I, I think it's, um, again, a really, really rich uh, conversation we saw unfolding. And, you know, I just want to say a big, a big thanks to Scott for this uh, really, really incredible a readout and comprehensive review that was involved everybody in the community. You know, it's such a strong community and, and so many perspectives um, contribute to the collective whole. So uh, thanks to everyone for attending. Um, there'll be lots and lots of follow-ups, which will be uh, uh, fun to participate in and hope everybody has a great uh, Memorial Day weekend. 
Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Brian, for, for the role. Thank you, Hang, for uh, 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 playing, playing a, a fantastic role. I can't wait to see the, the, chat, the chat transcript. As a participant, you're going to be able to get the recording of this. In the recording, there's also the chat, so you can go back and forth. Uh, please give us feedback, what you liked, what you'd like to see more of. That's always helpful uh, as, as we go through uh, the ambiguity of the future together. Thanks so much and have a great weekend.